a hearty welcome to all of you and for this event. Uh, I think the highlight, or one of the highlights so far has been getting to know uh, Dr. Kosman a little bit. Uh, both he and I are uh, strangers, as it were, in a, in a different land. Uh, and it's always good to meet a brother or sister who can relate to, to my experience as a, someone who, who loves the States and lives here, uh, but also understands that the sun feels different here than it does in your uh, homeland. That's a quotation from a Cuban singer, Celia Cruz. Maybe some of you know her. Um, all right, so um, like Kristen said, uh, the goal of today's um, lecture is, is more to get us thinking uh, about the Bible as a whole. Uh, the, the word that kept coming to my mind uh, was meta, in the sense that the, what I want is to give you um, the sort of meta-narrative of the Bible, how it uh, talks as a whole on the subject of the relationship between women and they're uh, leading uh, the various congregations, either the people of Israel or the ecclesia uh, in the New Testament, the church. Um, and so uh, while I will speak for a few minutes on the text itself, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14, uh, what I mostly want to do is to um, think biblically uh, the Bible as a whole on uh, women and their leadership uh, of the people of God. So uh, the title is Paul's Strategy in a World that Despised Women, Reflections in 1 Timothy 9 to 15. And I've divided this uh, short outline uh, into six points. And the first point is uh, the following, and it's uh, a question for you. Uh, that I hope you take seriously and, and wrestle with, uh, both here and as you uh, leave this place. Is the apparent teaching of 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15 common in the Bible? Now, I'm using the word apparent um, because on the face of it, uh, it certainly looks like Paul is saying to women, you cannot teach uh, or lead uh, a place where men are uh, and, teach, and teach them and guide them in the Holy Scriptures. On the face of it, that's what it appears to be saying. And therefore, I've used the word, the apparent teaching of 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15. And so the question is, that apparent teaching, is it common in the Bible? Because what I have found is that uh, for many people, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I read First Timothy 2, 9 to 15, and um, that's, uh, that's everywhere in the Bible. Is it? I want to challenge that today. Um, and I want to say to you, first of all, that one of the reasons why First Timothy 2, 9 to 15, um, how to summarize it, uh, that that Women cannot lead men. Uh, that's the way that I will summarize it. Women cannot lead men. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this idea, uh, this summary, for many of you, I will suggest, feels as if, it, as if it's a common biblical teaching, perhaps because of your location as readers of Scripture. It may not be the text itself, that uh, gives you the idea that this is very common teaching of the Bible, but it may be that you have been raised in a place where that is the way that the text is read. If there's anything that we have learned from modern hermeneutics and from um, uh, postmodernity and so on, is that where you read the text, the place where you come from, to read the text has an effect on how you read the text. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a Pentecostal friend, 
and I ran this idea by him, and he said, oh, no, 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, we rarely think of it as, uh, as a prohibition that is universal for women in the church. And I thought that, I thought that was interesting. Uh, whereas other people who come from a different tradition view this text as expressing something that is quite common in the rest of the Bible. And so I want to push back against that and say that this is, this is actually a strange, a very strange text, in my opinion. And so that leads me to thesis number one. Think of uh, uh, point number one there as a preface. Thesis number one and Roman numeral two, the apparent teaching of 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15 is actually very uncommon in the Bible. This apparent teaching, which I have summarized as women cannot lead men or women cannot lead where men are present. This apparent teaching, I want to say, it's very uncommon in the Bible. And there are some, a number of examples where do, we actually do find women leading the entire congregation. And I provide you with some examples here, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, from the Old Testament, uh, one of the most fascinating texts is uh, Miriam, uh, the sister of Moses and Aaron. Uh, and there, uh, by the Red Sea, when Israel is liberated by God, she sings. She sings just like uh, Moses sings. Uh, but uh, the author of the text is, is sure to say that Miriam the prophet, Miriam the prophet, she's not just Miriam the sister of Moses or Aaron, but Miriam the prophet. And there in song, she leads the people of Israel to give thanks to God for liberating them from the horse uh, and the warrior and the Egyptians that wanted to kill them. Now, music to me is instructive. It, it serves a very strong instructing place in, in, in the Bible and in the church. And if you don't believe that, read Colossians chapter 3. You know, I see my friend Zach Hicks here. I learned a lot of theology just by listening to him and listening to his song. And so Miriam, by her singing, was leading and teaching the people of God. That's one example. Another example, another example is Deborah, who is the, one of the judges uh, in that strange period in the land of Israel. Uh, strange, um, or even the stories show you that it's a strange period. And she is a prophet. She is a leader of the people of Israel. And men come to her to seek advice on how to uh, protect and lead Israel against the Philistines. That's the second example. Another example is Huldah uh, from 2 Kings 22, 14, 20. She also is a prophet. And just like with Deborah, uh, people come to her, men come to her asking for advice uh, because she's a prophet of God. And, and the Bible is very straightforward, speaking of Huldah. Uh, I can say that a lot of this material I, I've gathered from my wife's book. Um, so, so she's been very helpful with that, and I want to recognize that. Uh, but uh, Huldah is, is, a, is a prophet, uh, is a female prophet in a world of male prophets, but she's a prophet nonetheless. When we move to the New Testament, we have uh, another group of women who are seen uh, in some way leading um, the people of God. Or from a, a minimalist perspective, um, not hiding behind the wall, as it were, <laughs> when it's time to instruct the people of God. They're there. They're not shy. Uh, they are not acting as if this is a prohibition against them. One example, of course, is found with Priscilla and her husband Aquila. And um, we find her in the book of Acts and we find her in Romans. It should be Romans 16.3, I'm sorry, there. 
uh, not 16.3, but Romans 16.3. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Priscilla is that she is many times mentioned first uh, when she's introduced in the text. Not always. Uh, we have to be fair. She's not always uh, first mentioned, but many times she is, and we hear of Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, there's a fascinating example when, where they hear the powerful preacher Apollos, uh, who must have been an amazing preacher from all we read in Scripture, uh, but uh, he, was, he didn't quite understand how Jesus fit in salvation history. I, I, I guess I would put it that way. And, uh, and here's Priscilla approaching this powerful preacher uh, and instructing him. And it, it sounds like she is taking the lead in this. Uh, we hear in Romans 16 about Phoebe, uh, that she's a deaconess, a servant in the church. And it is fascinating that uh, Paul calls her a benefactor. Uh, and, and if you look at the ancient uh, Greco-Roman world, a world of honor and shame, uh, a world where wealth distribution was not uh, even close to what it is today, even though today is still uh, very, uh, or, or not very fair, let's say. But back then, uh, if you wanted to survive, it was very good to have a benefactor uh, who would help you get work, who may give you money when you were short, who would help you uh, to make ends meet sometimes. And Paul is not ashamed, even though he is the apostle, to say that Phoebe was not only the benefactor of many Christians in the area of Corinth, but that she was his benefactor. Uh, just imagine that for a minute. Phoebe was his benefactor. He was willing to accept that. Um, how that translated into uh, her work as a female leader in the church might be a little bit speculative on my part to say. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push on that. But I will say that uh, if churches met in her home, and apparently they did, uh, I would think it very difficult that Phoebe would be quiet the entire time, <laughs> if anything, because it's her house. Um, so she's another example. And then uh, a third example that I find fascinating is uh, there's two difficult names for us, Euodia uh, and Syntyche from uh, Philippians 4, 2 to 3. And I actually do want to read this text with us. Uh, if you didn't have a Bible, uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. I'll read from this one found this one at home on the way here and thought that you can cause some damage if you hit somebody with it. But anyways, uh, in Philippians 4, 2 through 3, uh, Paul pleads for unity. Uh, Philippians is a letter of unity, isn't it? How often times, uh, how many times, excuse me, we hear, you know, be one. Uh, and be one on the basis of humility. And the greatest humility of all demonstrated by the kenosis of Christ Jesus. And here in verse 2, he says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So he calls them out in public, as it were, as this letter is being read. Be of the same mind in the Lord. Does that remind you of chapter 2? Have this mind, which is also in Christ Jesus. And it is this, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help this woman, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement, the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. The language there for contended uh, leads to me to the uh, idea of, uh, we'll use the Greek word, apologia, or defense of the gospel. Uh, not apology as in apologizing that you're a Christian, but apologia in defending the gospel. And apologia is something that is done verbally. Okay, you defend the gospel, uh, sure, with your example of being a committed Christian, but there comes a time when in persecution where you have to verbalize 
uh, why you are a Christian. First Peter chapter 3, right? Talks about that. Uh, but, but these women are said to have contended at my side, uh, which leads me to believe that uh, Paul was not the only one speaking and doing an apologia defending the gospel, but that these women too were defending the gospel. One last example uh, from Romans 16, which is, of course, a fascinating chapter as a whole, uh, is Eunia, uh, which uh, for, for, for many centuries was, was uh, thought to be a male, uh, but I think most people today would agree that she, she is a female. Uh, and Eunia is said to be an apostle, uh, at least the way I read this text. In Romans 16, 7, Paul says, I greet Andronicus and Eunia, probably a married couple who were doing ministry together. How beautiful, you know, in the case of, in the case of uh, married folks, that they were doing ministry together. Get, greet Andronicus and Eunia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. So imagine that. They have, been, uh, they have shared a prison with Paul, uh, maybe under house arrest with him likely under house arrest with him. Um, they are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So you're looking at Jewish believers here, right? They were in Christ before Paul was, and Paul calls them out outstanding among the apostles. Now, I very much doubt that Paul is including Andronicus and Eunia uh, with the twelve. Uh, it, it appears that the 12 in early Christianity had a, a special authority, uh, but that they were not the only ones called apostles. Others are called apostles in the Bible. Um, Barnabas is called an apostle in the Bible. I think is it James is also called an apostle in the Bible. Um, and, and, uh, and the idea of an apostle is someone who has been sent uh, by one over them by one, for the sake of, of the argument here, superior over them, uh, to deliver a message. And so to call Andronicus and Eunia apostles is, 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 is a powerful statement. Uh, and it gives you the idea that they were sent by Paul to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, uh, both, as a, uh, both as a couple, Andronicus and Eunia. So there you have a number of examples from, from the Old and the New Testament that if you had those texts uh, read week after week and not 1 Timothy chapter 2, and then after weeks and, and weeks of reading this text, you suddenly went to 1 Timothy 2, uh, it is possible that you might say, wow, where did this passage come out of this 1 Timothy 2 with this prohibition? I thought Paul was cool. <laughs> now, pardon the expression, with, with women also leading the people of God in teaching. And that's precisely what I am suggesting, that uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2, especially 11 to 14, is a strange text. This is number two, uh, uh, well, uh, Roman numeral three in your handout. Why then the prohibition of, in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15? And here I just want to talk for a couple of minutes. How, many, how much time do I have left? I'm sorry, I lost track of time here. Okay, that's good. Oh, oh good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think my students must, must make fun of me because in class I always ask them, uh, how, how many more minutes do we have? <laughs> yeah, I'm not friend. Uh, time and I are have an interesting relationship. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, then why, if, if, if in fact uh, in the Bible you see women either alone or as a team uh, with other men, as in the case of uh, Euodia and Syntyche, or perhaps their spouse, as in the case with Andronicus, why, if they are allowed to, to teach and lead the congregation, why do we have this very strong text? And it is a very strong text. Uh, I, I think you know what my view in this uh, whole debate is. Um, I don't have to say it. Um, and I don't say it because I don't like labels. Um, anyways, 
But, uh, but I will say that uh, if I belong to the other camp, uh, I would find this, this verses as my strongest uh, evidence, um, to be fair. Why then, despite this woman leading the people of God in the Old and New Testament, why then the prohibitions in 1 Timothy 2, 9-15? Uh, I want to say a couple of things about that text, 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, and it is that it is full of topoi or themes that you also find in moral philosophers in the, in the Greco-Roman period. So statements about, you know, a woman um, should not uh, have a hairdo that is made of uh, gold or uh, golden plates, you also find that in many moral philosophers. You see people like Plutarch, uh, for example. Uh, the idea of not wearing fancy uh, necklaces of pearl, uh, we also find moral philosophers saying, don't do that. That's not what a decent woman does. Uh, in fact, many philosophers suggest that a good woman uh, should dress in a very plain manner and that the way she dresses reflects her virtuous character. And so it's interesting that when you read Paul there in, in 2.9 to 15, uh, he sounds just like one of these moral philosophers. And that is why, for example, some, some people who do not believe that Paul wrote the pastoral epistles uh, say, uh, this can't be Paul, because this doesn't sound like the liberating Paul of Galatians, this sounds more like the patriarchalist Paul uh, that, uh, of the moral philosophers of the period. And, and that's a strong point, something to think about and reflect. Um, and so Paul is using this language. Why use this language all of a sudden? Um, a language that was uh, reserved for women in the Greco-Roman culture and also in Hellenistic Judaism uh, who were uh, addressing in a way, in a deportment, that was not the acceptable one. Uh, Paul is uh, joining them, but as I, I think, as you see in the rest of the pastoral epistles and the rest of the New Testament, uh, he is not hateful of women. I think it's clear that Paul doesn't hate women. Uh, can I say that Plutarch or um, Seneca hated women? Uh, well, I don't know enough to say that. <laughs> Uh, but you do get the sense many times that uh, women are there for, for, for a couple of things in life, and then we can do without them. Um, so, so women in the Greco-Roman world, just to give you an idea, uh, there is this uh, amazing essay that uh, Plutarch, again, a moral philosopher of the period, wrote, uh, and it's called On, on the Bride and Groom. And it's, and it's this philosopher uh, instructing a young couple that is about to get married on how they should behave in public and in private. And it's fascinating because it gives you an idea of how, uh, how women were viewed at that time. And, and he says things like this. Uh, when you and your future husband are in public, let him do the talking. You, 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 you be quiet. Let him do the talking. Uh, in another part, he says, uh, let it be like uh, the flute. Um, uh, where, where, the, where the instrument, you're just the instrument through which um, your husband is doing the talking. Uh, uh, be silent all the time. Uh, it was just embarrassing if in a symposium, uh, you know, uh, a party, let's call, it a, let's call that, a, that's what it was, <laughs> a party where you're, you know, having a drink and, and eating and talking philosophy, it would have been seen as... Uh, not right if a woman sort of jumped in into the middle of the conversation and said, well, well I disagree with what Plato says there, you know, <laughs> or, you know, Aristotle is totally wrong there. Here's what I think about, you know, that, that was not acceptable in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, and so I believe, uh, and I'm not the only one, that, that the prohibition in 1 Timothy 2.9 is all about what was happening on the ground what was happening in the churches that Paul is writing to. My view from this text 
an other text, you would have to buy the commentary to see the other text. Um, I have an 11 year old, you know, uh, he's in private school. Um, so, you know, if you want to buy the commentary, it would help the Padilla family. Um, but in any case, uh, I think that is what's happening. I think that you have some women in the church, probably wealthy, perhaps widows, uh, who, when the church is meeting, uh, are interrupting the lesson uh, and are doing something that is not acceptable, acceptable in that culture, and that that could have jeopardized the witness of the gospel in that context. And so Paul takes the strong language of moral philosophers, more than moral philosophers, but, but especially moral philosophers of the period. He takes the strong language and he applies it to this, to this situation. So uh, I guess the, the portrait that I've been trying to paint for you is the following. Is there a contradiction between those texts that we read on the one hand in the Old and New Testament where women seem to lead and this text in 1 Timothy where women are supposed to just be quiet. And my answer is that I don't think that there is a contradiction, that I think the difference is primarily because of the particular situation that Paul, or if you don't believe Paul wrote the pastorals, let's call him pastor, that uh, the circumstances that pastor is dealing with in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. And so I want you to consider that um, well. Uh, this leads me to number four, thesis number two. It is likely that in the quote-unquote egalitarian, and I put it in, in quotation marks because uh, the whole modern concept of egalitarianism uh, is, a modern, is a modern thing. It would be anachronistic to read it back into the first century. Therefore, I put it in quotation marks. Uh, it is likely that in the egalitarian communities founded by Paul, some women, especially wealthy ones, we're treating males with disrespect. I think this is what is happening as we drill further down into 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, that in the egalitarian communities that Paul founded, some women, uh, especially wealthy ones, were treating males with disrespect. Uh, and they, the best example that I can think of is Corinth. Uh, Paul founded the church at Corinth. Uh, he taught them the gospel, but then after he left Corinth, and there's an interesting book by Bruce Winter, fascinating book called After Paul Left Corinth. Uh, but after Paul left Corinth, the Corinthians fell back into uh, patterns of their culture that were contradictory of the gospel. And so Paul had to write back to them and say, wait a minute, you are totally misunderstanding the, the resurrection and you're misunderstanding uh, sexuality in the marriage and so on and so forth. So it would not be the first time that Paul's egalitarian mentality, let's put it that way, is misunderstood by the church. It would not be the first time if in 1 Timothy then uh, some women are being disrespectful to male in such a way that Paul has to use strong language to stop them. Uh, it would not be the first time that something like that happens in Paul's ministry in my opinion, it has already happened in 1 Corinthians, okay? Uh, one of the best examples is the issue with the veil in 1 Corinthians 11, right? Where he says to the women, uh, put on a veil. There is debate whether the veil is, is their hair. Um, some scholars think that uh, the veil is not a material, but wear your hair in such a way that it's sort of covering your face. Uh, other people think that it's actually a veil. Uh, put on a veil uh, when you're in public like that uh, and, and, and be relatively quiet. Uh, in other words, be respectful of the men around you because that was the way that in that culture you showed respect. And uh, I don't know, have any of you ever been in a church where the men sit on one side, the woman on the other, and where the women have to actually put on a veil? Have any of you been in that situation? I've been in that situation in a Romanian church, I remember, uh, in Chicago, uh, I was invited and I was shocked uh, when all the men sat on one side, the women on the other side, and, and all the women had either hats uh, or a veil because it was a sign of respect to the males in the congregation. That's how they interpreted uh, 1 Corinthians 11, and they continue to interpret it 
uh, up to, to the present, 1 Corinthians 11. And so uh, Paul there in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, is, is telling the women, uh, yes, uh, as, I've taught, as I've taught, let me paraphrase here what I think is happening, I've taught you that we are all one in Christ. There is neither uh, slave or free, Greek or Jew, male and female. Uh, uh, but be careful that you don't behave in such a way that you begin to be disrespectful of men because you have to remember that God created him first and you came out of his rib. So he's the older. He deserves some respect. And I think that this is exactly what is happening in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, it is um, a case of taking the quote-unquote egalitarian uh, understanding of the Christian community that Paul had uh, and, and pushing it too far to the point of women uh, disrespecting men. And that would have been uh, a monstrosity in the Greco-Roman world. And so Paul is very strong. Remember, Paul is not uh, a North American nice guy. <laughs> He's a Mediterranean Jew <laughs> from the first century. And so he can, he, can, he can come and speak to you very straightforward. And that's exactly what he does here in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy chapter 2. That, that leads me to thesis number three. Paul's goal is for male and females to minister together. The, wor the way I read Paul is that he, his goal is for male and females to minister together. But he had to proceed with caution, lest the Christian mission be jeopardized. He had to proceed with caution, lest the Christian mission be jeopardized. Females couldn't take much of a lead too fast and too strong because, as I suggest in my title, uh, the view of women by elite males was not a charitable one. Um, so for just one second, because now it's telling me, oh, you forgot to say something. So let me go back. I think one of the best examples to show uh, how uh, generally speaking, women were viewed in the Greco-Roman world is when you read uh, uh, the Aeneid. Okay, and in the Aeneid, when the Greeks are destroying uh, Troy, and Aeneas, the hero, is is uh, bringing his family out. Come on, let's 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 go out. Let's get in a boat. Let's get out of here. Um, who does he put? Who does he put over his shoulders um, to protect? To, uh, to make sure that, that he doesn't die. It's not his wife. It's his father. Uh, his father is old, and so, yes, surely ne he needed help, but his wife, she's a woman uh, in the middle of a battle, okay? Uh, and so my modern sensibilities, the first time I read uh, the Aeneid, I was scandalized when I read that. I said, what? Because then the, his wife actually gets killed as they are going from the land to the boat, to the ship, and her ghost appears to Aeneas. And I thought, wow, you know, you gave this to a you know, 21st century American, and they would say, oh, this is crazy. Of course you're going to take your wife uh, or your child and put them over your shoulders. Uh, that comes first, it's, you know. Husband, wife, wife, husband, that's the primary, if, 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 you know, if you think of a pyramid, that's the primary relationship, but, but, but not so in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Um, maybe on paper sometimes, but, but you see this, and that gives you a good idea. Uh, Aeneas carries his dad over his shoulder and while his wife gets killed. Uh, normally, women were viewed as uh, there to produce children, and to raise good children in the home. Uh, again, there were, there were exceptions, you know. We read in some parts of ancient literature that women should stay in their home and not get a tan. So isn't, isn't life interesting? Today, everybody wants to get a tan. <laughs> but back then, a woman who was darker and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, and had a tan, it, it showed that she maybe wasn't at home as long as much as she should be, you see. She should be at home, and so her color should be more ivory. 
uh, because that showed that, that, that if you stay home. Read also uh, um, Homer, right? Uh, Penelope was a devoted wife to Odysseus. Now remember, the Iliad and the Odyssey were the foundational texts of the, of the Greek world, and the Aeneid was the foundational text of the, at least of part, later part of the Roman world. And so they were very important. But, but if you read the Odyssey, you see that Odysseus, although he, he loves Penelope in a way, he, uh, you know, he's not, he's not afraid to, to indulge with other women when the opportunity comes as well. Uh, and, and then, aside from the, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, Plutarch, in that text that I told you about on the bride and groom, here's what he tells the bride. He says, look, uh, your husband is going to be faithful to you, but if here and there he wants, he wants to go out with his buddies uh, to the prostitutes and he wants to have sex with the prostitutes, let him, let him have a little on the side. It's actually good for him. It's gonna, he's going to fulfill his fantasies, and so that's going to keep things going better at home. How would you feel if you're a woman and you're being, you're being told, accept that on the part of your husband? So when I use the word or women were hated, you can see maybe where I'm coming from. Um, all right. Back to thesis three, and I'm almost done here. So again, uh, Paul's goal is for male and females to minister together, but he had to proceed with caution because of the hate for women that I, that I think there existed, lest the Christian mission be jeopardized. Uh, Paul was a missionary theologian. And many things he does the way he does things the way he does because he's also thinking about the mission. Because Paul really believed that only the gospel, only in the gospel, does society have a chance to change. Ultimately, he believed that only the gospel had the power to change society. And then the text that expresses that in a most powerful way, perhaps, is Galatians 3:26 to 28. Uh, the text is very well known by all. I'll read it very quickly, and then um, I, my time will be done. Um, in 26, Paul says, so, Christ Jesus, so in Christ Jesus, united to Christ, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ. Now, by the way, think about baptism there, right? It's, it's the, the sign of the covenant. Uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the Christian faith. What was the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament faith? It, it was circumcision, right? Can a woman be circumcised? Well, she cannot, right? So think about now, in, in, in Christ, a woman can also be baptized, and she can feel like she really belongs uh, into the covenant. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Jewish women didn't feel like they belong in the covenant, but I think that with baptism and their ability to be baptized, I think there was something more there. Um, and so, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, it is my belief that this Paul was wanting this to be a concrete reality. Paul was not plat no Platonist who said, oh yeah, these are, these are beautiful ideas in the mind of God, but they're not supposed to come down to, the, to, to reality. Paul was not like that. Paul wanted these ideas to become concrete, to, be, to, comp to become realities. And so, for example, in Romans 14 and 15, you see him struggling as Jews and Gentile Christians are coming to eat together and they're having problems because the Gentiles believers are bringing some food that some of the Jewish Christians couldn't eat or they didn't feel free to eat, right? And so we have the whole thing about the wicker sister, the wicker brother, be careful. But he was trying to bring them together to eat, to be really one, concretely, not just in the mind of God. Uh, what about slavery? Well, Paul couldn't go to be, uh, before the forum and pick it <laughs> and say, let's finish slavery. If you think he could do that, then you totally, ha you haven't uh, 
you haven't understood how the ancient world worked. It's not, nor, it's not modern North America where you could go pick it. No, you, you, you know, they'll, they'll take your head off for that. Uh, you couldn't just do, do that. And, uh, and slavery, which, which of course is, is evil and was evil, uh, was sort of the economic infrastructure of the ancient world. If all of a sudden all slaves were freed, well, how were, how were, how were they going to feed their families? Who was going to take care of a broken bone? Uh, and so even though it was evil, uh, slavery was evil, uh, the situation for many slaves, being in the home of an owner, uh, especially if it was a person who loved their slaves, and there were many uh, wealthy men and women who loved their slaves, they would provide food for you, they would provide you know, medical care for you, and so on. Again, I do not say that that is, that that is correct, that God sanctioned slavery. But what I'm saying is that at that time, there was no social security, just like there is not in many countries. And if you don't have uh, a canopy of protection over you, you were going to be out there by yourself. It's like that still in many places in my country. You know. So, so, so Paul couldn't just go and pick it. Uh, However, that doesn't mean that he didn't want slavery to continue. He wanted slavery to finish. And I think that you see that concretely in the letter to Philemon. Because he says, accept Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but now as a brother in Christ. And the way I read that, and not just me, but many other commentaries, is that accept Onesimus now, free him. Free him. So Paul wanted the reality of the kingdom of God to be real now, but he had to go slow, starting in the ecclesia, in the church, because if it went too fast, uh, the, uh, the police, let's say, I'm thinking of a book called Police in the Roman Empire, uh, but the authorities, the, Gre the Greco-Roman authorities, and other people in the culture would... Uh, would not accept that. So, so Paul had to go slow. Any of you who have been on leader, in leadership, you know what I'm talking about. You have, a great, you have what you think is a great idea. Uh, you think it's biblical. You're convinced it's biblical. And you want to bring it into the church. And you bring it, and then you realize that you went too fast because people are not accepting it. All right? Because you have to go slow. And that's why you see this... Uh, yeah, this lack of speed, if you will, uh, in with slavery and Jews and Gentiles in Paul. And lastly, that also is the case with women. Uh, Paul, in my opinion, wanted women to serve side by side with men. Uh, as I read 1 Corinthians 11 uh, and those, those other chapters, he wanted the women to prophesy, to give to the churches a word of the Lord that the Lord is giving to them. Uh, of course they were not going to be able to teach them from the Torah because they probably didn't know how to, how to read. Who knew how to read and write in antiquity? You know, very few, very few people. You knew how to read and write as a female, perhaps, if you were the daughter of a wealthy, uh, of a wealthy man who might have paid an, an independent philosopher to come into your house and teach your children how to read and write. But that would have been the minority. And uh, Lucian the philosopher or the essayist makes all kinds of fun of that. Uh, you know, philosophers come into a house to teach, to teach the women uh, some philosophy, but the woman is more interested in, you know, hey, how does the lipstick look on me? And, you know, so that, that, that's kind of the, uh, the ancient world for you. Paul wanted women and men serving together as ministers in the gospel because they also have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Serving in the church, leading in the church, was not a matter of your sexuality. It was a matter of your new identity in Christ, being in Jesus, being, being in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. But, you say, great. That all sounds great. Or some of you may be saying, I, mm, I disagree with a bunch of that. But, you might say, what about 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14? Very quickly, I think that the main issue here is the use of Scripture. Uh, 
my own journey with this text and with this whole thing of quote unquote women in ministry, I hate to use that phrase, but I have to use it today. But my whole journey in that uh, is a complex one. It took many years, uh, but always what, what sort of held me from uh, going to the other camp, as it were, uh, was the fact that Paul used scripture. And I, and I would always say, well, Paul uses scripture. So no, women cannot teach men because Paul says, bases it on the Bible. And then one day in my office, I, the thought just came out of nowhere, where what else is he going to base it on? He's a Christian Jewish apostle. Of course he's going to base any command or anything in the Bible. I mean, he has a couple of places in 1 Corinthians where he quotes from a, from a Greek, you know, bad company. Well, how does it go? You know, uh, bad company corrupts morals. Uh, a very famous statement. But being a, an apostle, a Jewish Greek apostle, his book is the Bible. Of course he's going to use the Bible when he's going to make any kind of correction or any kind of exhortation. And that was the first time that it just it, it dawned on me that, wait a minute, maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Maybe, maybe, maybe I need to rethink this. And I began to re rethink the whole thing. And that leads me to thesis number four, and it is this. The use of Scripture does not negate the occasionality of Paul's exhortations. Paul writes to churches to solve problems that were happening in those churches. He was putting out fires all the time. And of course he's going to use the Bible when he's putting out those fires because that is the Word of God. But just because he used the Bible doesn't mean that that text should be used forever and in the same way. Again, the use of Scripture does not negate the occasionality of Paul's exhortations. And one of the examples is the, the thing of the veil. You know, I bet that in your churches, women don't wear veils. But Paul says that you should do it. He tells the women to do it. Why don't you do it? <laughs> Say, well, well, because we know that that was cultural. Oh, really? But it's from the Bible. No, you implicitly understand that the use of Scripture in one text of Scripture does not negate, the use of the Old Testament, especially in one text of the New Testament, does not negate uh, the occasionality of Paul's exhortation. He could use the Bible, he will use the Bible, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't make the text uh, applicable for every place and every time uh, forever until the end of the world. I would suggest to you that Paul's use of Scripture in 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14 is illustrative. Illustrative. Let me provide you with an illustration of what happens, what can happen when women are disrespectful of males. 